Good morning and welcome to St. Peter's virtual service. Uh, this is the Sunday of October 4th, 2020. This is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. And we're so glad you could join us. The altar flowers this morning, these beautiful altar flowers, are given by Tom Courtway in celebration of 25 years of marriage to the wonderful Melissa. Congratulations, guys, we love you. Some announcements in the life of the church. We are continuing with our weekday services, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, evening prayer at 6 p.m. Compline is at 8 p.m. on Tuesday and Thursday. We're very thankful for Cody Blackman, uh, who is discerning a call to join us with that. So thank you, Cody. We also sent this past week out a Peter's Pence. Uh, if you didn't receive it, please give a call to the church or contact Peggy or myself. Uh, there's some really important information in there, particularly around uh, the state of our financial situation as we move into uh, the 30th week of COVID, et cetera. So please take a look at that, as well as some other interesting and informative uh, information for or, uh, knowledge that as we lead into October. Today's music, the processional, is from the hymnal, page 448, O oh, Love, How Deep, How Broad, How High. And the recessional is from Lift Every Voice and Sing, number 114, Every Time I Feel the Spirit. With that, we'll get going in a second. Thank you. service continues. Holy Eucharist, Rite 2, page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer, or page 2 of your worship booklet, page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed, blessed be, be his, his kingdom, kingdom now, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.
number 22, found on page 234 of the Book of Common Prayer, or page 3 of your worship booklet. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our guest lector this morning is Judy Helm. A reading from Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please join me in reading Psalm 19 on page 606 uh, in the Book of Common Prayer and page 4 of the Worship Bulletin. We'll read responsibly by verse. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone out in all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes, it goes forth, forth from, from the, the uttermost, uttermost edge of the heavens, heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing, nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just, and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, much more than fine gold, sweeter far than honey and honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. 
Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's on page five of the booklet. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory Glory to to you, you, Lord Lord Christ. Christ. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. When the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. And when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. One who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. 
They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Good morning again, and welcome to the 30th Sunday of the coronavirus in this season of unordinary time. And thanks, Bonda Moyer, for this reference. Now, last week I was moved, as were so many of you, by Reverend Peggy's powerful words. It might, in, in what might be called a soul-searing lament for division. Peggy reminded us that with God, there is no single pie where one group's gain causes another's loss, that God is the source of limitless grace. And as we persist in this endless season of pandemic, I found myself, before hearing the sermon, harboring many resentments, many places where I felt sharply divided from my friend and my neighbor, whether it's about wearing a mask or a political affiliation or where they get their news or even what church they attend. I discovered lots of ways that I was cutting God's kingdom into little pieces of pie, and that the more pie they got, the less there was for me. So Peggy's words were a much needed balm to my soul, a reminder that in God's universe, there's grace enough for us all. And my peace lasted about 48 hours until a dumpster fire of a presidential debate plunged me back into a world of division and discord and resentment. The less said about this, the better, especially from the pulpit. All I can say is we are better than this. And I realized that I needed to change my narrative or my story in this pandemic in this season of endless division. I can rest in the peace of God's never-ending realizing of God's kingdom, no matter how dark things look. But I can't just be a bystander. I have to do something. I have to find hope. Now the Sam Cooke song, A Change Is Gonna Come, came to mind as I thought about that. It's about the inevitability of hope, especially in darkness. Lord, there's been a time that I thought I couldn't last for long, but now I think I'm able to carry on. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. Change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. Cook wrote this in 1963 on the eve of the civil rights battles, and, and he died in 64 before it was released. But nevertheless, it became a theme song for the civil rights efforts in this country. And there's something redemptive, I find, about Cook's words resonating from the grave, moving a people to march, to hope, to make that change happen. I'm asking you, right now, don't you feel a little bit of something just like that? Just under the surface, that sense that the change is happening whether we like it or not. And isn't that just like God, who would make a worldwide reset, the COVID-19 pandemic, along with social unrest and political division, who would make all that what it takes to crack us open so a change gonna come? Isn't that just like God? Now today's readings reflect just such a massive change as I think we're feeling. In Philippians, Paul places his own story at the center of a big change. He's writing to the small and conservative military town of Philippi. It's the first church he established in Europe, and it's deep within Roman influence. And he knows the hardships 
that the Philippians are enduring. You see, these Gentile God-fearers are using anti-patriotic language for this Jesus. They're calling him Lord, calling him Kyrios. Hey, that's language reserved for the emperor. And they're refusing to participate in the temple festivals. Further proof that they're opposing almighty Rome. How dare they? Much of the letter is about Paul's urging them to put on the mind of Christ so they too can endure any hardship. Here he uses his own story to get them not to look back, to not let a nostalgia for the way things used to be cloud the immensity and glory of what's coming. As a Jew, he was by all rights a righteous man, he tells us, a Pharisee persecuting the church, blameless under the law. If anyone should resist change, it would be Paul. He's got a lot of privilege to protect. But instead, he throws himself into the middle of change. He reconfigures entirely Israel's story of election, the Messiah, and exaltation into a story of Jesus Christ. Paul's righteousness is not in conforming to Torah, but in faith in God's righteousness in Christ. And he's no longer the persecutor. He becomes the persecuted, fearing for his very life in an Ephesian prison. See, Paul knew a change is going to come, and he welcomed it. In today's gospel reading, the parable of the wicked tenants is actually more of an allegory than it is a parable. And we quickly see it's directed to the temple leaders and the Pharisees. Jesus is in the temple, he's surrounded by the crowds, and he's ranting at these leaders. Now, he's wise enough not to call them out directly, which would get him thrown in prison but instead uses the wicked tenant story to make them realize their disfavor with God. By the end, they understand this, but can do nothing because of Jesus' popularity. And in the middle of the reading, there's an interesting exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees and chief priests. He finishes the story of the wicked tenants with a question. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Put those miserable wretches to death and lease the vineyard to other tenants. Tenants who will bring him the produce, the produce at harvest time. That's their reply. And Jesus' response neither affirms nor denies the response, but it's kind of a, it kind of comes out of nowhere. He cites Isaiah. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Just what does a cornerstone have to do with the just destruction of those wretched tenants. What does that, that have to do with law and order, with justice? Even today, wouldn't most of us agree that the vineyard tenants have to be tried and punished for their actions? That's the law and order episode we'd expect, isn't it? Change is going to come. Yes, it will. And Jesus goes further. This is important. The rejected cornerstone becomes a stumbling block. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and will crush anyone on whom it falls. These aren't two kinds of death, though, but a choice between redemption and destruction. When we fall on the stone, the resurrected Christ, we are broken from our previous selves. And we're remade in Christ. We're inserting ourselves into Christ's story of life, death, and resurrection. But if we don't do this, the crushing stone falls on us and destroys us. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change going to come. Oh, yes, it will. You know, it's been said the only proponent of change is a baby with a wet diaper. Depending on where you are on the political spectrum these days, you may find yourself agreeing or disagreeing with this statement, which begs the, begs the question, where's the gospel? Where's the good news for those on the other side of this political divide? If the gospel doesn't speak to anyone, everyone, can it speak for anyone? If the gospel doesn't speak to everyone, can it speak for anyone? And that's where the cornerstone, the stumbling block comes in. You see, God's project is so much greater than individual personalities and politics. God's big project is one of unification 
of getting us to overcome petty division to realize and love our shared humanity. We're invited to look through a God lens, not our own. In today's Old Testament reading, we heard about the commandment not to create idols and made me think of the influential book, Dynamics of Faith, by the 20th century theologian Paul Tillich. Paul Tillich. Because he wrote extensively about faith and idolatry. And how easily the latter, that is idolatry, can replace faith. Part of being human, he claims, is to have what he calls an ultimate concern. We choose faith in God as an ultimate concern when it transcends everything we think, do, or believe. Ultimate concern is a big deal. The problem is, Tillich says, we all too easily substitute other things as ultimate concerns in terms of value. Things like nationalism, or success, or politics, material stuff, and so forth. We replace those for God, and Tillich calls that idolatry. And the key to understanding where we're putting, whether we're putting ultimate faith in God or in God-like idols is to look where we think we will find salvation. And through this lens, I think idolatry, idolatry pops up all around. Think about it. If so-and-so is elected next month, we'll be saved or doomed, which is the opposite of salvation. If this person gets appointed to that position, we'll be doomed, we'll be saved. These lives matter more, or those lives matter more. If I have this drink, it'll help me deal with the pain. If I get this job or promotion or spouse, I'll be released from pain, loneliness, and despair. Now, to be clear, Tillich doesn't suggest we can't have those hopes, fears, concerns, and habits. They are very much a part of living. They aren't in themselves idols. It's when they interfere with our faith in the true ultimate concern, which is God, that they become idols. Especially if we think that God is at work only in that election outcome, or in that nation, or in that appointment. That's idolatry. And I think you'd agree we see it on both sides. You see, God is at work in all of us. God's covenant is to bring us all together, to heal all divisions, to make the lion lie with the lamb, put all things in subjection under his Christ. And as the church, we are called to be the workshop, the testing grounds of that great healing project, both within our walls and out in the world. We're called to help heal all divisions. And you know these next few weeks are going to be brutal. The need for healing will be greater than ever. I invite us to call upon God's healing powers now, and then later, regardless of the outcome. And we start today, we start with healing ourselves. Because we're all probably a little broken lately, aren't we? Then we heal our divisions, and we heal our nation, and we heal the world. Not because some of us are uniquely God-given, but because we're all God-given. All of us are created to love God with all our hearts, souls, and might. And love our neighbor, all our neighbors, as ourselves. And that's when true change, real change, is going to come. Let's not get distracted. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. Amen. Please join me in reciting the words of our faith found in the Nicene Creed. It can be found on page 358 of the Book of Common Prayer or page 6 of your worship booklet. We believe in one God, the, the Father, Father, the, the Almighty, Almighty, maker, maker of, heaven of heaven and earth, of all, of all that, that is, seen, seen and unseen. We believe, we believe in, in one Lord Jesus Christ, Christ the, the only Son of God, God eternally begotten of the Father, 
God, God from God, God light, light from light, light true, God true God from true God, God begotten, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through, through him all things were made. For us, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are found on the Book of Common Prayer, page 383, and the seventh page of the um, worship booklet. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For our bishop and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For this city, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick, and the suffering. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray especially this day for Lee, the Cool and family, Frank and Betty, Jackie, Anne and family, Thomas, Paige, Mason, Carly, Olivia, Austin, Sarah, Fred and Judy, Kay, Liz, Nancy, Aaron and family, Mike and family, Rick and family, Angie and Chauncey, Father Pat and Janet, Jen and Chris, Trent, Brian and Lauren, Shannon and Anissa, Jim and Maudie, those battling COVID, especially the President and First Lady, for doctors, nurses, technicians, and first responders, teachers, students, staff, law enforcement officers, and those striving for justice, and Tanya, Trey, and Hannah. We pray in loving support for the Wisdom House, Moaz and Natalie. We are in continued prayers for Sarah Edmondson, Jackie Saroy, Betty Long, Judith McAfee, Carol Sue Greenwell. And are there any others? Chandler, D, Bob. 
we offer our thanksgivings this morning. We give thanks for the people of St. Peter's and the visitors with us this week. We give thanks for Suzanne, Jim, John, Elena, and Claudia Wilton. We give thanks for our card ministry. We give thanks for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We give thanks for the Muslim Student Association at Hendricks. We give thanks for the bishops of the Anglican Communion. We give thanks for St. John's Episcopal Church in Camden, St. Nicholas's Episcopal Church in Maumel, and the Right Reverend Larry Mays, retired bishop. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. We pray especially for George, Patricia, David, Bill, and any others. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. In the communion of Peter and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our Lord, to thee, to thee O Lord, Lord our, our God. God. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Confession of Sin is found on page 360 of the Book of Common Prayer, or page 9 of your worship booklet. Let us confess our sins to God and our neighbor. Most merciful, Most merciful God, God, we confess, confess that we have sinned against you in thought, thought word, and deed, by what, by what we have done, done and by what, what we, we have left undone. Done. We have we not have loved you with our whole heart. heart. We, we have, have not loved, loved our neighbors, neighbors as ourselves. We, we are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. <laughs> Walk in love as Christ loved us, give himself an offering and sacrifice to God.
Prayer A begins on page 361 of the Book of Common Prayer, or page 10 of your worship booklet. The Lord be with you. And also, also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them, them to, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give him thanks, thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life, and made us in your image, and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we join you, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. infinite love you made us for yourself and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ your only and eternal son to share our human nature to live and die as one of us to reconcile us to you the God and Father of all he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. and When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. <laughs> celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and and peace. And the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. <laughs> As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, Therefore let, let us keep, keep the feast. The feast. Alleluia. Alleluia! The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And wherever you are on your journey of faith, know you are welcome at Christ's table. Post-communion prayer is found on page 365 of the Book of Common Prayer, or page 13 of your worship booklet. Let us pray. Eternal God, God Heavenly Father, Father you, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.